Tis the season to be jolly and not to be anxious about leaving your home. This festive season, make sure you stock up on Ring devices, which range from video doorbells to alarms and cameras. These easy-to-install smart home security products will give you peace of mind while you're away. As you can see, hear and talk to visitors from anywhere through your phone, tablet or PC. Ring's products are available at Take-A-Lot, Builders Warehouse, Incredible Connection, Vodacom and Leroy Merlin. For more information on these devices, either for yourself or to gift a loved one, visit ring.com. Because with Ring, you're always home. The hum of passengers is punctuated by the laughter of children. Dishes clang in the dining coach as coffees and teas are served and memories of the festive season just past are shared. The train's whistle sounds, but it has at every crossing. After a while, you don't even hear it anymore. But this time is different, and tragedy is about to unfold. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 139, The Kroenstadt Rail Disaster. This episode is sponsored by the So What podcast. If I say Ruder Lantmann, I'm pretty sure that for most South Africans, the carte blanche music and Sunday nights come to mind. For years, Ruda was, along with her colleagues at carte blanche, the source of hot topic reporting and important insights. And just because she's no longer on the show doesn't mean that incredible journalistic brain has stopped assessing the world in its unique way. Considering her husband, JP, is a political economic analyst, I'm pretty sure the big issue delving continues to this day in the Lantman home. Imagine what that dinner table conversation is like. Well, the Lantmans thought that their dinner table conversations were pretty interesting too. So they started recording them. And now it's a podcast. Here's Ruda to tell you more about the So What podcast. Hello. I am Ruda Landman, host of the So What podcast, in which political economic analyst JP Landman takes a deep dive into one South African issue at a time. Whether it's load shedding, corruption, politics, economics, foreign policy, or anything in between, this is where you will find facts and insights to make informed decisions. The So What podcast, published monthly on all major platforms. The first 11 episodes were literally recorded around their dinner table, so you'll hear a little difference in the audio quality when they move into studio conditions. But the conversations and insights are incredible throughout. I highly recommend finding the So What podcast wherever you listen to True Crime South Africa and get that familiar voice back into your ears. A huge thank you to the So What podcast, for supporting True Crime South Africa. Since 2019, True Crime South Africa has been telling the stories of the victims of violent crime in South Africa. The podcast is independent. That means no big or even little corporates fund it. And that's just the way I like it. And it's the only independent podcast in South Africa that consistently charts in the top 10. Keeping a podcast like this going is time-consuming, and for the most part, it remains a one-woman process. It's me. I'm the one woman. You? Yes, you. Are the reason this podcast continues to flourish and help bring in tips on missing person and cold cases. If you'd like to help keep the show running, please consider supporting our sponsors, signing up to Patreon or PayPal, 
follow the show on the socials, as the kids say, and share it with your fellow partners in crime. You can find our social links and learn more about our sponsors at True Crime South Africa forward slash donate. Shout out to this week's Patreon and PayPal superstars. A huge thank you goes out to Ladia and Yaku Nordia for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much, everyone. Patreon supporters get one additional exclusive episode a month, a shout out on the pod, and other exclusive contents, including Q&As with me, as and when it's available. It's a minimum of $1 a month. I think you should do it. Please. And thank you. Keba. This week's subject matter is a little different from what I usually cover, in that it is a mass fatality event, which, although could have involved criminal liability at some point, is perhaps not what we would immediately see as a crime. There are many elements of this disaster, though, that are really relevant to the true crime arena, including the importance of being able to identify victims and how culpability can lay on many different doorsteps in different ways. In researching this case, I used a presentation by Brigadier Leonie Ras the head of the Victim Identification Centre, as well as the Investigation Findings Report from the Railway Safety Regulator. So, let's get into episode 139, The Kroenstadt Train Disaster. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. For South Africans, December and January are often a time of travel. Because the vast majority of South Africans cannot find work in the provinces they're born and raised in, we have a large part of our population who live in provinces far from their immediate families, and often even their children, who might remain behind with family to go to school while their parents work in other provinces. So, when the festive season arrives and many companies shut down for a week or two, it's the perfect opportunity for people to go home and spend time with loved ones. This, of course, involves long-distance travel, which, in addition to being expensive, can also be dangerous. As owning your own vehicle really is a luxury many can't afford, public transport becomes the go-to during this period, and it's sadly not always as safe as it should be. At the time of the case in question, the train service called the Shoshaloza Mail was a really helpful long-distance carrier. It did, of course, shut down for some time in recent years and has just started up again, but we'll talk about that a bit later. In January 2018, as many South Africans were kissing their loved ones goodbye after the festive season and getting ready to travel back to Gauteng for work, the Shoshaloza Mail was running and was a popular and relatively inexpensive way for people to travel long distances and it seemed far more safe than road travel, which of course it was, and is, for the most part. But on the 4th of January 2018, it became far more dangerous. The train driver that was scheduled to drive train number 37012 on the 4th of January had actually been scheduled on another trip originally. He was supposed to arrive for duty at 9pm on the evening of the 3rd, but he received notification that there had been significant delays and he should instead report at midnight and he would fill in on other trains until 37012 arrived at the station. When he arrived at Kronstadt train station, he found that the section manager to whom he needed to report had already left their post for the night. 
Part of the section manager's role is to ensure that train drivers are fit for duty. The drivers are supposed to be tested for substance use and general fitness in, in terms of having had enough sleep, etc., before they're allowed to drive trains. It would later emerge that the section manager had not had anyone to relieve them of their duties for almost a year. The person in that role was essentially on duty 24 hours per day, accumulating incredible overtime hours well over what was legally allowed, and when they were not present, there was no one to help them ensure driver fitness. This would all come out in the eventual investigation, and although I will say up front that it was never found that this had contributed in any way to the accident, it was noted as being very concerning, which I think is an understatement. Unfortunately, the section manager, who remains anonymous to avoid any fallout in their direction, was so concerned that they may be held accountable in some way that they ended up falsifying a driver fitness test for the driver of train 37012. It also emerged that the section manager had been begging for someone to be appointed to relieve them for many months. Without a fitness test, the driver proceeded to take over train 37012 from the previous driver who was clocking off. 37012 had originated in the Eastern Cape, and by the time additional passengers had boarded at Kronstadt train station, there were 547 passengers on board. The Passenger Rail Agency of South Africa, or PRASA, would later admit that they had no way of knowing exactly how many passengers were on board that day. It's not uncommon for people to illegally board without purchasing tickets, and some passengers may have disembarked earlier than expected, or not disembarked when they were scheduled to. The official number of 547 would be used in the eventual investigation, but identification processes would show this number was definitely off to some extent. The train consisted of several different sections, a diesel-powered locomotive, a car coach which would be used to transport vehicles, a power car which contained a power-producing unit, seven economy cars which are also called sitter coaches, one dining car, one kitchen car, six sleeper coaches, and one luggage van. For a train this size, 547 passengers meant it was overloaded, and this would be admitted in the eventual investigation. There were not enough seats for all the passengers, and not only were people standing in the sitter coaches, but the dining coach, which was reserved for eating and drinking only, was also being used by passengers as permanent seating. When the new train driver took over on train 37012, he said he was informed by the previous driver that the train had a fault, which limited it to a speed of 86 kilometers per hour. The driver said he was told that anything over that speed would cause the power to the train to trip, and speed would be severely reduced. The later report by Prasa claimed that this was not necessarily a fault as such, but a limiter that had been implemented on certain trains to avoid them travelling at dangerous speeds. The driver's assistant said that they had not heard the previous driver say this and that she should have been informed of any faults as the assistant driver, but was not told about this. Either way, the train was driven at an average speed of 78 kilometers per hour during the entire trip. This could later be determined by the black box in the train, which is the same as the devices installed in aircraft to help figure out the causes of accidents. The black box records sound in the driver's compartment, as well as any and all activity the train is programmed to undertake, including its speed and when brakes are applied. <laughs>
37012 set off from Kronstadt that morning. Passengers were settling into the journey, some dozing in their seats, some walking through the carriages to the dining car to buy coffee and tea. About 20 kilometers outside of Kronstadt train station, 37012 began to approach a crossing. The crossing was located on a piece of farmland called Geneva, which had a road open to the public and was regularly used by trucks. The road crossed the train tracks, and there were stop signs on either side of the tracks, as well as warning signs earlier on the road, warning drivers that they were approaching a train track. The vegetation alongside the road was quite overgrown at the stop sign itself, but at the warning sign locations, which were approximately 100 metres before the stop signs, there was no vegetation, and there was a clear view of the train track and oncoming trains. Along the train track itself, the driver had a clear view, and as was regulation, there were whistle signs along the track every few hundred metres before a crossing, where train drivers were required to sound their whistles as they approached a crossing, even if they didn't see any obstructions on or near the tracks. At 500 metres from the crossing, though, even before arriving at the first whistle sign, which was at 400 metres, the driver spotted a large truck approaching the crossing. He activated his whistle as soon as he saw the truck, but soon realised that it was not stopping at the stop sign, and instead it was continuing over the railway tracks. Although the driver would later say he believed he had applied the brakes of the train during this time, the train's black box showed that the brakes had not been applied, and instead the driver had throttled down from the eighth notch to the first notch, which would also have the effect of slowing down the train. A train travelling at the speed that 37012 was would in any case take close to a kilometre to come to a complete stop, even if the brakes had been applied at that moment. The driver continued to blow his whistle as he watched the truck advance over the tracks. The truck had two sections, and although the driver section and the first part of it had passed over the tracks, as the train approached, the back portion of the truck did not have enough time to fully clear the tracks, and at 8.59am the train collided with the truck. It proceeded to drag the truck for 400 metres before the train came to a full stop. In this process, 10 of the 12 coaches derailed and toppled over. Passengers had not been given any emergency briefing on how to escape the train in the event of an accident. Terrifyingly, the driver and assistant driver would also admit that they'd never been given any training on how to assist passengers if they were involved in an accident either. Passengers, of course, had no idea what had happened. One minute they were on the tracks, and next their coaches were flying through the air. Some just skidded and managed to stay upright. Others toppled over. One man would later recall how he'd managed to gain his bearings quite quickly, got his family together, and they managed to exit their coach. But most were not that lucky. The coach doors did not have any emergency release buttons, and they were far too heavy for passengers to open manually on their own. The windows were tiny far too small for even children to get out of. The initial crash and derailment had caused injuries to passengers. Some were flung out of their seats and broke bones and hit their heads, or were hit by flying pieces of unsecured luggage. People were terrified and in shock, but for the most part, none of what had occurred at that point was lethal. That was until about 10 minutes after the initial crash, when some passengers were making their way out of the two coaches. Five of the coaches, though, remained sealed. 
And as passengers attempted to free themselves, a horrifying series of events began to play out. The power lines that ran over the train lines, which would ordinarily power electric trains, had become toppled over in the derailment. Ordinarily in such cases, the power should cut out when the line becomes unstable, but on that day, they did not. Not only did the power lines remain charged with the electricity, but as the poles and lines sagged, they began to make contact with some of the coaches. Sparks flew as arcing occurred between the power lines and the metal surface of the train coaches, and then flames. There would be conflicting accounts of whether one coach had caught fire that day and that fire had spread, or if there had been several different fires. The eventual investigation would conclude that each individual coach had caught fire on its own as power lines made contact, and chaos ensued. The SAPS had arrived on the scene of the accident within minutes and were present when the fires started, but it would take some time to get emergency services, including a fire truck there, due to how far out the location of the accident was, and those minutes would be deadly. As soon as the threat of fire was evident, panic levels skyrocketed. Passengers who had already freed themselves tried to open the coaches that were still sealed. Some were successful, and a few trapped passengers already coughing from smoke poured from the carriages, but a few of the coaches remained sealed for far too long. Although the coaches appeared to have been built to European specifications with fire retardant materials, the fires that engulfed the coaches that day were just too ferocious. It would eventually be determined that in areas, the fire had been as hot as 800 degrees Celsius. Soon, the metal surface of some of the coaches became too hot to touch, and those outside could not continue their attempts to free the trapped without seriously injuring themselves. Although there were fire extinguishers on the train, many were found not to be working, and those that did work were almost useless against the intensely hot flames. Even as emergency services arrived, there was nothing that could be done immediately to assist those trapped, and screams filled the air. Some would later say they were not sure if those screams were coming from inside the coaches or from those witnessing the horror from outside. For most, it didn't matter. Those screams continued to haunt their memories of that day. By the time the fires were extinguished, a deathly silence had settled over the scene. 254 people were transported to hospitals in the surrounding areas, and members of the SAPS's Victim Identification Unit were alerted to a mass fatality event in their jurisdiction. In the days that followed, as PRASA coordinated efforts from family members across the country to find their loved ones who'd been on the train, 24 people were reported missing who could not be found among the injured in hospital or the uninjured survivors. Recovering the bodies of the deceased from the burnt-out coaches was an incredibly long and arduous process. The remains were all extremely badly damaged, and as the remains arrived at the nearest mortuary, pathologists there activated Disaster Victim Identification, or DVI, protocols. These same protocols are used throughout the world whenever there is a mass fatality event. In plane crashes, because of the extensive security around boarding a plane, identification is often far easier. In South Africa, there are a few factors that make this much more difficult for us when other modes of transport are involved in mass fatality incidents. Although there are sometimes manifests for trains, buses and other forms of long-distance transport, these are often not sufficient to identify all of the victims. 
this is because security at many train stations and bus terminals is not great. And it's not uncommon for non-paying passengers to make their way onto the mode of transport. Train surfers are another issue in South Africa. These are people who will jump onto the outside of trains as they pass and ride holding onto the train until they reach a destination they want to disembark at. An additional layer in South Africa is that we have a large migrant population of people from neighboring countries who've entered the country, sometimes illegally, and are undocumented at the time of their deaths. These people are usually not reported missing by their family members because there is little daily contact. And sadly, as such, it's incredibly difficult to give these victims their names back. It would take some time for the scene to be completely safe for the Victim Identification Centre members to work in. And although in the early days, sent detection dogs were allowed to work at the site, it would take five days before the VIC team were permitted to start working through the coaches to ensure that no victim remains had been left behind. Brigadier Leonie Russ explains that her team spent many hours sifting through the rubble that remained in the coaches. They used a similar system to gold panners, working through a sift full of rubble at a time, looking for anything that resembled human remains. A forensic anthropologist accompanied the team to help in identifying bones they may find. What complicated this was that many passengers had been bringing meat back from their holidays, so bones discovered could well belong to either animals or human beings. The team was able to identify and recover several pieces of human bone, as well as bone fragments, which were taken back to the mortuary for processing. The news media covered the train crash quite widely in the days after it happened. Many international outlets also covered the story, as the train service was one that tourists often used, and there was always the possibility that some of the unidentified victims were foreign tourists. Of course, immediately the public and victims' families wanted to know who was going to be held responsible for the tragedy. The truck driver and his passenger survived the accident, and there were reports that the driver had attempted to flee the scene but was arrested by police. Some media outlets reported that the truck driver had been charged with culpable homicide, but none of these statements were attributed to the SAPS, and it's important to remember that every unnatural death must be investigated in South Africa, but that is exactly the nature of the investigation, to determine how the unnatural death occurred and whether there is any possible culpability for the death, or if it was an accident. Unfortunately, this distinction is often not made in the media, and outlets will report that, quote, a murder case is being investigated, end quote, or something similar, which sometimes leads to an unnecessary uproar in the public domain when the general consensus is that charging the person may be unfair. This is common when people cause the deaths of intruders in their homes, where media will often report that a murder investigation is ongoing, or going as far as to claim that the individual has been charged with something when they haven't. It's irresponsible, and often not done purposefully, but has a lot to do with not understanding the system or making the effort to ensure information is accurate. Now, I do not know whether or not this was the case with the truck driver here, because it's far too late for us to uncover that part of the truth. I can tell you that the truck driver did accompany police to the closest hospital, where drug and alcohol tests were administered, and he was found not to be under the influence of anything. The protocols that would be undertaken by the forensic pathologist to aid in identifying the victims would ordinarily include both primary and secondary identifiers. Primary identifiers are fingerprints, DNA, and dental records. 
In this case, fingerprints were not possible for most of the victims. Although dental records are often used in other countries, such as the US or the UK, in South Africa, because such a large portion of our population does not have access to affordable dental care, dental records are largely non-existent and not often used for identification here. So the only remaining possibility for primary identifiers here would be DNA. Sometimes remains can be so badly destroyed that DNA cannot be retrieved with ordinary methods. There are laboratories in countries like Bosnia-Herzegovina which have developed DNA extraction methods that are far beyond what most countries' labs have available to them, and occasionally we do send remains to this and other similar labs, but it is an expensive process, so attempting to use what we have here first is always best. The secondary identifiers which can be used to identify victims include tattoos, implants and scars. Unfortunately, of course, with severely burned remains, tattoos and scars will not be of any help, but implants in bones or other medical devices may survive intense heat and may be of assistance. Perhaps one of the most devastating moments of this investigation came a few days after the accident during one of the autopsies on the deceased victims. I will warn you that this is extremely graphic and difficult to listen to. Forensic pathologists had begun an autopsy on what they believed was the body of an adult female. But after scanning the body to understand what they were dealing with in the badly burned remains, they made a horrifying discovery. The remains, which they thought belonged to one person, actually belonged to three. A mother had crouched down on the floor of the carriage she was trapped in and taken her two children in her arms. One child had seemingly huddled under each arm and she'd done her absolute best to protect her children from the approaching fire. And that is how the family had died, huddled together. The three had become one, and I can only hope that they had lost consciousness from smoke inhalation before the fire was upon them. The family was identified according to the report I read, but their names were not released. It is scenes like this that would haunt those who deal with mass fatality events and this horrifying crash in particular. Thankfully, the VRC members worked tirelessly making use of rapid DNA technology methods to identify victims. Eventually, it would be determined that 24 people had lost their lives in the Kronstadt rail disaster. 21 of the individuals were positively identified, two female victims could not be positively identified, and one male victim was known to have been on the train by eyewitnesses and other information, but no sign of his remains were ever found. By the 26th of January, most of the remains had been handed back to their families and Prasa helped to fund burials. Despite the incredible tragedy of this incident and the clear failings I've already pointed out that were identified by the railway provider, it certainly was a major win for the SAPS Victim Identification Unit, as identifications in, in such mass fatality events often take much longer to conclude. Even with the burials concluded, though, the families would only really gain any closure from the results of a full investigation into the incident so that they could understand exactly how this had happened. The report was eventually released in October of that year and determined that the outright cause of the accident had been the truck driver's failure to stop at the stop sign or heed the whistle warnings of the oncoming train. This, of course, is undoubtedly correct. 
But the question remained, did the truck driver's behavior cause the deaths of 24 people? The report went deeper into this, attempting to determine whether Prasa or any of its staff members could have contributed to the passengers' deaths. Although the report acknowledged certain failings, such as the train driver not being fitness tested, many of these did not seem to contribute directly to the passengers' deaths, or at least not in a manner that could be proven. Essentially, even if the accident had happened in the way it had, there may have been one or two deaths, which of course would have been bad enough, but the report acknowledges that it was the fire that was the most deadly part of the incident. This, of course, was caused by the power van and overhead cables not automatically tripping when the accident happened, as they were supposed to. However, even if the fires had started, if the passengers had been able to safely exit, fatalities would undoubtedly have been minimized. It was therefore the lack of emergency exits and proper working fire equipment that had been the major contributing factor to the 24 deaths. Several pages of the report were dedicated to changes that were instructed to be made by PRASA in all trains operating in South Africa in future. These mainly involved implementing safety measures for passengers and training for staff, as well as tighter regulations around emergency exits and firefighting equipment. I could not find any updates as to whether the NPA had chosen to prosecute the truck driver. I may be wrong, but I tend to think that once they saw the PRASA report and realized that there were many contributing factors to the deaths which could easily be used as a defense by a sharp attorney, they likely decided not to proceed. As to whether any safety upgrades were actually made on South African trains after this incident, I have no idea, because there is no further information available about that. The Shoshaloza Mail continued operating just five days after the incident until 2020, when another incident occurred, in which two trains crashed head-on, resulting in the death of one passenger. In that case, the cause of the crash was found to be the theft of signaling mechanisms on the tracks, and the train systems stopped operating at that time. Prasso would claim that it had more to do with the COVID lockdown that it impacted travel, but I do have to wonder whether they saw that safety on the tracks was quickly slipping out of their hands, and they might soon have to deal with another calamity of tragic proportions, which they may not have been able to investigate, report, and recommend themselves out of from a culpability standpoint. Of course, it must be said that it is entirely possible that Prasa took responsibility in a private settlement with the victims' families, and this was just never released publicly. Just last month, Prasa announced that the Shoshaloza mail service was up and running again. The initial trips run between Johannesburg and Cape Town, and they've not been terribly successful with considerable delays, seemingly caused by cable thefts and other issues. I wondered if this relaunch had come with increased safety measures, but of the reports I could find online, no one spoke of any safety briefings they'd received when boarding, nor any mention of there being prominent fire equipment on board or emergency exits. As is probably standard for South Africans, some of the biggest concerns have been around possible criminal activity on the trains, such as robberies. The train stations and the trains themselves are still accessible to anyone from the public so this is a fair concern. I know train accidents are rare, but perhaps this form of safety should be of equal concern to us. I know no one ever thinks it's going to happen to them. How many times have you boarded an aeroplane and ignored the safety talk being given by the flight crew? <laughs> 
I have, probably too many times. And I can't help but think that that same human attitude may prevail in train safety. But that shouldn't stop rail providers from ensuring these measures are in place. And it certainly shouldn't stop us, as commuters, from asking for this to be taken into account. On a recent trip to Johannesburg, I used the cow train for the first time in a very long time. It really is a great and professionally run service. But while I was researching this case, I thought to myself that if something had happened while I was in that train, I would have had no idea what to do. Sadly, I was unable to find the names of the 21 identified victims of the Kronstadt rail disaster, so I cannot give my usual sign-off in honour of the victims. But perhaps they would be far better honoured by us all becoming far more vigilant about safety matters on the means of transport we use on a daily basis. Mass fatalities like this sadly happen far too regularly in South Africa, and equally often, no one is held responsible. So they happen again and again. And as the Shoshaloza male sets off again into the South African landscape, providing a much needed, albeit slightly seemingly unreliable transport service between major South African cities, if the deaths of these 24 victims and the trauma of the survivors has not made some real impact somewhere in the system, are we just counting down to the next one? To the next mom huddled in a sealed off coach with her babies, waiting for help that never comes. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on Spotify or the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. A healthier, happier, more productive life starts with good sleep. Make sure you invest in the right bed. Dialer Bed stocks the best bed brands at the best prices. Shop at 76 stores nationwide or online.